I'm Wayne Kirby, and I'm looking forward to playing at the Asheville Guitar Bar on Friday with Mr. Jimmy. The earliest memories I have of music started with a recollection of reaching up as high as I could to the keys on my grandfather's piano and making sounds that just vibrated through my whole body. That's the first thing I remember. And the second most wonderful moment in my entire life was when my parents took me to my first parade in downtown Patterson and I heard music coming down the road and then I started feeling something in my body that vibrated every inch of me and it was the bass drum and that's when I was completely hooked. I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey in the late 40s and 50s and it was a mill town at that time. It was a textile mill and it was like the Wild West. There were bars on literally every corner that ran 24 hours a day and the music being played in all of the bars with the exception of two African-American bars was country music until rockabilly started taking over. And so I heard lots of country music and when I was about 13, my father, when he was working day shift, would come pick me up and I would bring my guitar and he convinced the people in the bands to let me sit in. And that's how I learned to play guitar, was sitting in with the big guys and learn all the classic country tunes. And um, so that shaped me. And my grandfather listened to Enrico Caruso records all the time. So I learned about something about classical music. Uh, my uncle listened to big band and rockabilly. And so all of that just came together and gave me an eclectic view of what music is. I started getting paid playing guitar, playing weddings and bar mitzvahs and family gatherings. And I was doing pretty well and I was up to two nights a week uh, by the time I was 15. But I noticed that the guys that were really getting lots and lots of work were bass players. And I went, ah, I'm gonna buy a Fender Jazz bass. And then I started working four, five nights a week and that's when things really started taking off was uh, when I finally got my bass guitar. And then shortly thereafter, I was in high school and I had announced to my father that I wanted to be a professional musician. And he told me that I wouldn't be able to ever make a living as a, as a musician. And I was determined to show him that I could. <laughs> so I worked so hard and hustled to find every job I could, playing guitar, playing bass, playing keys. And eventually, um, things started going really well. I met a girl at a neighboring high school named Debbie Harry. And she was a year ahead of me in high school. And she was known as the most beautiful girl in New Jersey. And when I first laid eyes on her, I realized she really was the most beautiful girl in New Jersey. Eventually, we decided to form a band together and we signed to Capitol Records to Artie Kornfeld, who had become the new 25-year-old um, vice president of Capitol Records East Coast. And Capitol thought we were gonna be the next giant stars. And that didn't happen, but Artie Kornfeld really gave me my big first break. He asked me if I knew how to arrange. And I said, of course I do. The answer really was, of course I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I had lots of training in conducting and keyboards and ear training and theory and composition. And I thought, heck, I can, I can arrange a rock and roll record. And so he started with our own album and I did all the string arrangements and horn arrangements. 
And he liked what I did. And then he brought me on another project um, for Capitol Records. I did the entire album. And he said, you can have any instruments you want. Cost is no concern. And that, this was my laboratory. And I was getting paid handsomely to learn how to arrange. Um, and he ultimately teamed up with a guy named Michael Lang on a, with a band called Carnival Connection. And I did a record project for Artie Kornfeld and Michael Lang, who was the manager of the band. At that time, I was hanging out with Michael and he said, you know, Artie and I are going to put on a festival and we're going to do it up in Woodstock. And the rest is history. And I became involved with Woodstock Ventures as they were trying to find the venture capital to put it on. And Artie's the one that really got me to become a real arranger. And that led into me being able to write charts for The Tonight Show when Johnny Carson was in New York and The Merv Griffin Show when Merv was in New York. And I got more and more education in how to write in those on environments and how to adapt certain studio arrangements for bands because they were basically big bands. Uh, and that ultimately led to uh, working um, some Broadway with Bette Midler and doing some records for uh, re record sessions with Barry Manilow in New York before he was a star. I went to, I graduated from Juilliard uh, in 1970 with a bachelor's degree in uh, double bass performance. I also studied conducting and composition. And then Yale invited me to go there for, our, I was actually in their doctoral program. Special, I, at that time, my focus was electronic music composition with Violent Arell from the Columbia Princeton uh, Electronic Music Center, a legendary pioneer. And then also studying double bass. And then I, I had been starting to go out and play with people like uh, playing bass with uh, Robert Goulet and Liberace and uh, many, many people of that um, sort. And then um, I played with Sergio Franchi and I, I just finished up my master's degree rather than finish my doctorate with the agreement from Yale that I could go back and finish the doctor as long as I came in, came back within a year. I went out with Sergio to play bass and then he, I never mentioned it to him, but he had heard that I was an arranger and asked me to write some charts. And then he asked me to conduct the rehearsal and then hired me as his music director. Um, and so I put it off my education for a few years and then one day I was, I, and I was conducting all over the world. It was a dream job. It combined popular music and symphonic work. And I could do real conducting, real arranging in all different styles. And I was lying on the beach with my girlfriend in, in Puerto Rico. And I turned to her and I said, what am I doing with my life? I need to go to med school. And she said, you're crazy. You're making all this money and you want to stop now? Why don't you wait till the horse dies? <laughs> but I had made up my mind that I was going to go back and finish a doctorate. And it turned out it was a music in music, art and technology. So I had to qualify in art and music at New York University. And I was able to do my work on the road and they made allowances for me to have people tape lectures and mail them to me in South Africa or wherever I was. And so those, those were my academic uh, credentials were those, uh, those three universities. Yeah. Composition and improvisation to me are the same thing, except one is harder, the one you do in real time. <laughs> you want to make a good composition uh, improvisationally in real time and make it great, that's really, really hard. When you're writing 
over a long period of time, taking five days to write a minute's worth of music, that's kind of easy to me. But standing up there on the line, making sure that you're playing notes that are beautiful and moving and grooving and interacting with all the other musicians, to me, that's what it's all about. I'm a black belt. I started martial arts when I was 16, so I guess in 1962 I began in martial arts. I was a boxer before then, I was a, uh, when I was a boy, and we had boxing programs. Even one of my grammar schools had a boxing program, grammar school. A, a ring, the whole thing, bags. Um, and where I grew up at the time in Patterson, New Jersey, was a very, very rough town very rough, a lot of violence in the streets, in the factories. And so you really needed to know how to take care of yourself. And, my, and I was a pretty small guy. And uh, so my father wanted to make sure I knew how to fight. And he had fought on Okinawa during World War II in the Marine Corps. And he knew that there were martial arts available and there were schools starting to come up in, uh, in the United States and on military bases and all. So he actually hired somebody to teach me Goju Ryu, which is an Okinawan martial arts style. Base. Cool. So for the next number of years, in the 60s, I studied with, with him. William C.C. C. Chen went back um, to karate and I, I continued on there through the 70s and then started Taekwondo in the 80s and rose up through the ranks and a couple of years ago I made it to a ninth degree black belt which is the highest level you can go in, in traditional Taekwondo and uh, come, it comes with the title of Grandmaster. So I've taught thousands of students and uh, besides uh, music that's my other love. I came off the road and moved to a farmhouse in Southside Virginia to finish up my dissertation. Last chapter of my dissertation, the most complex of, of, the, uh, of the, the work, of the book. But in the meantime, I started applying for professorships and um, I had this f field that I was an expert in that everybody wanted. I knew about electronic music. I was a businessman in music. I owned a publishing company, um, production company, recording studio, had two records out. And so I know about the business, I knew about the technology, I owned recording, and, and everybody wanted to hire somebody to do this stuff. But I was one of only two people with the experience and doctorates. Briefly though, there was a book called what color is your parachute? And it's a book to help people decide how to find a job, a new job, or to change jobs. And it was a self-inventory, and I, I did it, and I think I answered it all of them honestly, and I said, you know, you need to be in a small liberal arts college with a program, a new program in music, business, and technology. And somebody from Yale said, you know what, there's an opening in Asheville. And so I applied to it. Yeah, and so I, I was here for three years, and uh, UNCA invited me back. They made me chairman for 20 years. I built the department, the jazz program, brought Bob on, Bob Moak, to, to teach for me and help build the program. And, uh, and then retired uh, when I was around 73, just working uh, as hard as I could to build something really important uh, for the community and the state. And, for the, uh, for all of us. Uh, I've been working with Vince Jr. for about a year and a half. And I love it, it's very tightly rehearsed, but we do have input, all of us, into the arrangements, which I like. And uh, I have to practice every day to keep my chops up. And um, I love being on stage with the guys, the band, Everybody's so totally different, but get together 
uh, at rehearsals and on gigs and socially and get along so well. It's just, it's a, a joy on and off stage with these guys. Fun, the audience enjoys it. It's, it's a blast. I think the owners of the Asheville Guitar Bar, Mark and Julia, are saints and, and artists and generous people um, who have made, they've created a community of not just musicians, but of, of community members and visitors to Asheville. Uh, it just, it just, had, they brought together so many disparate elements of our humanity together in such a loving way and have given musicians a place to, to, to mingle. And, and to play, and sometimes to make money, sometimes um, to make money and music. Um, it, it's just, uh, I've never seen anything like it anywhere where I've lived. You know, really, I had a superficial knowledge of the blues until 1964 when somebody gave me an album by Lightning Hopkins. And that turned my head around, and I went, this must be what they're talking about. And then Lead Belly. And then, I think what really turned my head was, I, when I was at Yale, we had these residencies. And one semester, it was Dizzy Gillespie. And all I did was hang out with him. The next one was B.B. King, and that's all I did. And I just, I didn't, I, he would talk about things and about it being a conversation, and it was just like through osmosis I started getting a feeling about phrasing and emoting and the general vibe of the blues, but that the blues were more than being blue, right? That the blues could be a lot of things, but they were intensely emotional. I mean, when you played, the, if you were really playing the blues, you were emoting. It talked about coming from the inside out. What do I think of the blues? I think it's a total mystery. It's one of the great mysteries of the universe.